All right, guys, we hope that, uh, hope that you enjoy the show. We hope you uh, accept it in the vein that it is. We're going to have a little fun, but we're also going to present some information. We're going to be back uh, with, uh, with Emily Crawford, our city manager, and our economic development director, uh, Ray Tipton. We're going to hear a couple uh, of guests from our school district, and then we're going to hear from a couple local businesses. Hope you guys enjoy the show. But <laughs> Welcome, everyone. I uh, hope you, uh, again, enjoy our show today. As we begin this morning, we're going to do a top ten list. You guys know how a top ten list works. These are from the city's checklist. So we came up with the top ten items that were, say, curious or unusual on the city's top ten list. And then I'll follow that with the very best question uh, from a councilman following the checklist item. So the, the number ten on our checklist this morning uh, or this afternoon, was a check to SHI Government Solutions, and the item was Watchdog. The best question from a councilman was by Councilman McMillan, who said, I thought we already had one of those. <laughs> the next item on our checklist was uh, to Nacho, N-A-C-C-H-O, and the item purchase was Nacho Dues. That was when Councilman Miller asked, if they're not our dues, why are we paying them? <laughs> Thank you. The next item on our checklist was a butter broom. And that's when Councilman Mathis asked, wouldn't a butter mop work better? <laughs> item number seven on the checklist was the Casco Industries check for a parade axe. That's when Councilman H.D. Jones asked, does that hang on the side of our parade ladder truck? <laughs> Item number six, a bed shaker. That's when Councilman D.A. asked, couldn't we just buy a used one from Motel 6? <laughs> Question or Item number five, blue line breachers. A check for a big bang box explosive. That's when City Finance Director Walter Milton asked, is that what we use to wake up the council members? <laughs> item number four, to Benchmark Supply Company, an item for duck butter lube. That's when I asked, do we sweep it up with our butter broom? <laughs> item number three, a check to USA Blue Book for skimming nuts. That's when Councilman McMillan asked, is that what Walter uses to give employee raises? <laughs> Item number two, to wiggly ants for a little green button. That's when Council Math Councilman Mathis popped up out of his chair and said, oh, can I push it, please? All right, item number one, can I have a drum roll, please? Item number one is to Haler Phillips for Black Magic Sand. That's when I ask, is this what we sprinkle on the budget to make it balanced? <laughs> All right, that does it for our tap 10. We're going to call up our first uh, guest with us this morning. Our first guests are going to be City Manager Emily Crawford and Economic Development Director Ray Tipton. Y'all help me in welcome into the stage this morning. All right, so Ray, you, you, you recently uh, left the chamber. We're here at the chamber banquet today. You left the chamber, and, and you moved over to the dark side, to the, to the government entity. So, so tell us, how's it going? How was your, how was your transition? It, it's going, really, it's going surprisingly well. I, uh, I, it's been a really smooth transition, actually, from really the private sector over to, to City Hall. Um, one thing that I've really thought, didn't expect, was... Y you know, city government sometimes has the reputation of being stern, and there's a lot of red tape, but there's really a lot of collaborative spirit up up there where uh, 
on the second floor, as we say, where I'm hanging out most days. Um, but I, I know any time that I have a need or, or anything that I want to do or pursue as far as the uh, economic development, grow the economy, if we're trying to recruit a business, and I make a call out to other departments, they all step up and, and really uh, help out as much as they can. One example was, uh, I think the first couple weeks I was there, Colin Sliger contacted me about relocating to Brownwood. Uh, I've reached out to uh, a lot of departments about uh, changing the uh, zoning from residential to commercial to accommodate him, and that's a process, as everybody knows, and uh, everybody stepped up and said, well, let's streamline this as much as possible. And that's just one example of kind of the collaborative spirit that I've experienced, which really wasn't what I expected. So it's been an easy transition for me, and I've, I have no regrets at all. Well, and that's a good transition for you, Emily. I know that the, the city adopted a set of core values, which was, I think, uh, at your lead. And, and as I understand, the core values are, are under the acronym I serve. That's correct. And so tell us why you adopted that acronym and, and, and how that plays into what we do on an everyday basis. Definitely. Well, council adopted the core values about a year ago, so we've been just operating under them for about a year. And it's an acronym called I serve, and it stands for integrity, service, excellence, respect, vision, and empathy. Um, that's a big mouthful, and it's a pretty high standard uh, that we've set for ourselves. But um, I've just seen so much uh, embodiment of that from our staff over this past year. We've had trainings. It's in our annual evaluations. Uh, we've been giving out awards for it. And um, I'm really, really proud of our staff and our council for recognizing that public servants have a very high standard um, that we need to set um, to our citizens and those that we serve. And so I'm really proud of that. So I know one of the things that I hear as mayor is that, hey, you know, we've got to be more, uh, we've got to more, be more consumer friendly, more focused on our business to help business grow. Is that catching on? Are, are the staff embracing that concept? How's it going? Oh, absolutely. And, and it's so fun for me because now I have department heads, other staff members coming to my office saying, hey, I had this idea. What if we did this or that? It would take less time. Or like Ray's example, what if we shortcutted um, the two public hearings and had them together t as one for the sake of the business being able to open sooner? And so I feel like that we know that we're making progress when it's not things that always ideas have to come directly from me or from the council, but when our own staff are coming up with those themselves. Okay. Well, Ray, that's a good transition. Let, let's talk about how are we doing, and let's start with some employment data. So just uh, on the year on our numbers, uh, these are our employment trends. I, I know the audience can see that on the screen, probably a little better than the card, but, you know, how did we do as far as employment goes? Well, we've been pretty consistently under the 4% mark on average uh, annually. I think for the last couple of years, it keeps pretty much in, in line with the state uh, and national trends as well. Uh, we there's always a little spike in the summer on unemployment, and that's that's kind of seasonal change, and we see that pretty much every year. There's not really any anomalies on that, but but as far as as I would say, they're good, strong unemployment numbers from the fact that they're they're consistently low. So one of the things that's interesting when we look at unemployment, I mean, obviously this is fantastic. We we, we want to see our unemployment be lower than the national and state average, which it is by by a couple of uh, hundredths of a percentage point, and. But, but does that create problems? Is there, is there issues there when we have such low unemployment? Yeah, it's absolutely a double-edged sword when you have low unemployment. And it sounds great, and you, you want to have that to some extent. But that also means when we're trying to recruit a major employer to come to town, and if they need 100 or 150 new employees, the first question is, well, where are those people going to come from? If your unemployment's so low, we got to pull these, these folks in. And that's where we reach out to uh, other resources to help and maybe even some surrounding counties, people commuting in. I know we've been talking to Brady. They're going through a, an unfortunate situation with some sand plants closing. And we've been working really close with their chamber and, and city on, because it's important for Brady to have those people still live in Brady, because you're talking about potentially a 1,000 layoffs total. And they don't want those people moving out. But if they can live in Brady, keep that lifestyle they want, but commute a short distance to Brownwood. So we're trying to tap into those things to solve those problems. So one of the things I've always said, people ask me, you know, over the years about what, what can we do to fight crime and, and how can we improve the crime problem in Brownwood? And I've always related that back to the economy uh, and said that, hey, when the economy is, is strong and people have jobs and, and they've got good paying jobs, we tend to see less, uh, less crime, 
uh, you know, more a reduction of crime. And so, Emily, are we, are we seeing that trend to be, to be true? Absolutely. This is one of the stats I'm really excited to talk about today because um, we have taken four major categories of reported crime, and in every single one, um, we are the lowest that we have been in a five-year history. And I think that's really incredible news. It's incredible news for Brownwood, for our citizens. And, of course, we want to we would love to take full credit for that with our lo uh, local law enforcement, and I do want to give a shout out to them who are here today. Um, yeah, let's give them a yeah. hand. And there, and, and there are things that we are doing locally. This is actually a national trend, so it's not just specific to Brownwood, um, but the things that we are doing locally to, to assist with this is, for one, the amount of training that we do. Um, we are constantly equipping and getting more skilled and more proficient in our craft. And, and so I attribute that um, to our local law enforcement and the training that they have. In addition, the citizen engagement that we really focus on, a national night out, um, having officers available and apparent in, in um, public events, things where we are interacting as law enforcement with the community during times where it's not an emergency and building that rapport and that trust with our community. Well, turning to other economic indicators, so one of the things we typically look at at this, at this conference or this presentation is real estate. So, Ray, you have a real estate background in addition to being an economic developer, but how did we do in real estate for the past year? So looking at the sales numbers for this year, it looks like, and, and this slides residential sales, the number of closed transactions, and it's uh, 413, which really, if you're looking back, this goes back to 2011 is, the, is an all-time high. I love looking at the real estate numbers. I mean, I'm passionate about re real estate and housing. That's uh, part of my background. But it's also one of those good indicators. I like to look at housing because sometimes that can be a leading indicator of if there's a weakness somewhere else in the economy. Either banks aren't making loans or people are unemployed. So when you see strong numbers like that consistently and going up, that, that means usually uh, the other numbers kind of follow suit. So, it, in fact, if you look at it, you know, back to 2012, 2013, and 14, I mean, we're at a 50% increase as far as the number of closing transactions. Absolutely. And, and that can tell other things. You don't want to read too much into it. Does that mean uh, that many new people are moving in? Is it, is it a, a, a function of new construction? And I would say it's probably a little all that. Okay, so, that, so that's volume, but what about our, our homes? Are they appreciating? Are they growing in value? What do we have as far as our average sales price, medium price? Yeah, so for the 2018 numbers, it looks like there, it's up a little bit uh, from last year. I think it's a little over 109000 is the average sales price on properties for 2018, which is up, I don't know, what is that, about 5% or so from the previous year. Uh, and, and I like to see those numbers, slow, steady growth, because for me, when you see slow, steady growth on the, uh, the average sales price, that's a sustainable growth. I don't like to see those big spikes, because if you have a big spike up, you're going to have a big drop at some yeah, point. Yeah, and, and I know for our audience, obviously, it's, it's a double-edged sword, right? Because values of your home go up, and that's great, because you're building equity. But what also happens? Taxes, taxes. right? And, and so, but, but what the chart is showing is that, uh, you know, we, we've had some moderate growth in the value of our real estate in the market. All right, so Emily, I know, you know, you, you transitioned, obviously, from economic development over into uh, the, the res or in the, the city manager role of that. And I know, you know, we, we focused for a long time on, on retail growth, and then we sort of transitioned uh, over into more of the city side of things with, with residential housing and really trying to address some, some residential housing needs. One of the reasons for that was that statistical very low unemployment, that if we don't have places for people to live, if we don't have quality housing, we can't get enough employees to serve our needs. So how are we doing in that, in that residential uh, commercial construction? Growth? You know, this last couple of years, we have really seen a tremendous amount of interest from our local builders, and in, in fact, even new builders and developers coming to town. And um, I, I want to give that kudos back to you. I know, Mayor, that was a, a big push that you had encouraged over the last few years about the housing market. And Indian Creek townhomes has been a game changer for us. Um, you know, before it was very difficult for people who were coming to Brownwood for work to either find temporary housing until they could purchase, or if they just weren't looking to buy a home. Um, our apartment complex um, opportunities were very limited, and that has completely um, eliminated that that concern for people coming to Brownwood um, for work purposes. Yeah, well, and I was just going to echo that with, with Indian Creek townhomes specifically. Uh, they kind of opened at the beginning of the year, late late the year before 2017. And I've used this story a few times, so if some of you have heard this, I apologize. But my dad moved back to Brownwood. He moved in in January of 2018. And when he moved in, he says, 
right? There's like nobody here. I have no friends. The parking lot's empty. And today when I visit, his, his story is there's just people everywhere and I can't find a parking place. So they've had a lot of success, which tells me there was a lot of pent-up demand for something like that. Um, but beyond the apartment complex, I think we also have to definitely bring up the fact that we've got a lot of residential single-family lots that are either available for construction now with Southampton Phase 3 is up and running. Um, we've had um, Southgate, 4th Street, several other parts of town are beginning to see new yeah. construction. You know, if you don't live in that area, you might not see it. Um, but when you get around and drive around, if you happen to live in that area, you've, you've obviously you've got major expansion of Southgate Phase 3 uh, and, and or Southampton Phase 3. And then Southgate off Southgate Drive, there's been a lot of building. So it, to me, is probably the most exciting thing that's happened in the last year to two years is to see how that new house market's taken off. It really is. And it's a little bit of a tip of the iceberg. I think, Ray, if, if everything in the pipeline comes through, we'll have about 100 lots available for construction. Yes, yeah, I was going to say. We're talking to developers wanting to do more, so we'll, we'll see a lot more of that in the next year or two for sure. Okay, so we have our annual building valuations, and, and, and so just to, to, to hit it and highlight it, you know, we've got a huge drop-off here uh, in, in the annual building valuations, and so we're, we're saying we're doing great in building, but uh, we, didn't, we didn't have as much total value this year to the tax roll. So, so why is that? Well, and a little bit of that is the way the numbers are reported. Uh, 2017 showed 23 million something, and uh, 2018 was 10 million something. But those numbers are calculated based on when the building permits issued. For instance, uh, the Hendrick, new Hendrick Medical Center that's under construction is about $11 million project. Well, that number was put in 2017 because that's when the permit was issued. Indian Creek Townhomes is the same way. And we have some other things like the shops at Pecan Bayou that's currently under construction. Those numbers actually show up already in the chart, so it, it doesn't reflect what's actually currently under construction, really. So let's, let's look at the one I usually lead with because I think it's one of the best indicators of, of the economy, and that's our sales tax collection. And so people are, I'm sure, tired of hearing me say it, but to me this one is so critically important because sales tax growth is necessary to offset inflation. So every year the city budget is going to go up by 1% to 2% because our cost of goods go up. So somewhere, if it's not going to come from Avalorum tax growth, somewhere we've got to be able to generate a little more revenue, and traditionally we have targeted sales tax growth for that. Now, there's, as people can see in the chart, there's a relationship, a correspondence here. The only tax increase we've done in the last several years was in the 17 year when we saw a, a tax decrease in our sales tax collection. Thankfully, uh, we bounced back this year to a 5% increase, and we're able to lower the tax rate a little bit uh, correspondingly. So, so talk about that a little bit, either of you or both of you. What, what do you attribute the, uh, the dip in the sales tax, and what do we attribute the, the bounce back? So on 2017, at the first quarter, if you remember, we got kind of rolled into the quote-unquote national retail apocalypse, and we had some, some pretty big stores close. Um, and so that first quarter of 2017, that's really why that number is reflected on, on the decline. But we've had some growth since then because we've, we've, number one, replaced some of those retailers. Uh, number two, I think sales are brisk across the board. We've done some things to help some mom and pops grow. Downtown's really, really uh, ramping up. And so all those things put together kind of help that. And it really, if you look at 2017 to 2018, it tells me we've, we've recovered economically from that decline. And, and even above that had growth. And we still have some vacancies we're working to fill. And it tells me that the next couple of years, there's the potential to grow even more once we get all those things in place. Great. All right, guys, well, we're about out of time for you guys. But uh, first, we've got to do a couple door prizes. So if you all get your red tickets out out there. Red um, tickets. We have got our first door prize is a $50 gift certificate to Domino's or from Domino's Pizza. Thank you, Domino's. And then we're going to second drawing will be a $25 gift certificate to Home Depot provided by Redstone Park. So, Emily, if you'll draw for the $50 Domino's Pizza certificate. Okay, last three digits, 949. Nine. You got a winner out there? I Start, see a hand. Yeah, There we go, right in the middle. All right, Sonny's bringing you your award. I was and hoping we wouldn't have a winner. Maybe we could keep it. Now, a $25 gift certificate to Home Depot provided by Redstone Park. Last three, oh, I didn't bring my glasses. Eight, nine, eight. Double check me. <laughs> okay, eight, nine, eight. I see a hand in the dark over there. Can I throw this like you did? You can. All right, All right uh, guys, appreciate you guys being here. We're going to transition out of this with an interview. So we, we asked some of our elementary students what they thought it was like to be mayor, uh, and here's what they said. Thank you. <laughs> Oh. 
What do I think the mayor does? Hmm. It runs a town, spends money on supplies that they need, and make and helps people solve their problems. He's like a president. Yeah. He's the chief of people. Takes care of the city. The mayor is the boss. He manages the city and he makes, he can make new laws for the city with his councilmen. Well, what I would do if I was the mayor, I think I would make a lot more buildings and so it would be a bigger town so more people could stay here. I would tell people what job to do so they can earn money. I would bring a Denny's, new school cafeteria food, and I would bring more places for kids to have fun. Build a Target. <laughs> I think I'd try to make a lot more smoothies. I would put more parks and bike trails, because if there's more bike trails, people would be safe on the side of the roads. What is my favorite thing about Broward? going to the train museum. I like the parks and our school. I like a lot of things here. People are really nice here. Um, all my friends are here. My favorite thing about Brownwood is that it's just a nice town and that I have a bunch of friends here and everything. And I have a bunch of family too. My favorite thing living as Brownwood is all the entertainment that we already have. Our next guest is going to be our BISD superintendent, Dr. Joe Young, and president of the school board, Michael Cloy. Guys, come on up. Welcome, guys. Give it up for the band, guys. Y'all can't see them, but they're back here having a ball. All right, so, so just tell us, what, what's going well at, at, at BISD today? Everything. Good. <laughs> well, we do. We have a lot of great things. Uh, academically, I like to brag on what we're doing at our, our secondary campus, especially at the high school. Uh, we started two years ago a dual enrollment program with the University of Texas called On Ramps. Uh, two years ago, we offered three of those courses. We offered physics. Uh, English and pre-cal. Those are courses that students are able to take through the University of Texas uh, with University of Texas professors and get University of Texas transcript and credits uh, and we provide that at no charge. Uh, this year we expanded that. We now have five. We added U.S. history and chemistry and so we're proud of that. In addition to that we continue to have all the dual credit offerings that we've always had. We've used uh, Ranger Junior College. We also use Howard Payne. Uh, this year we have a little unique situation with Howard Payne in that we have a couple of students uh, that are really at the top of their class and they really maxed out the offerings uh, that TEA has to offer. Chemistry 1 is a, the highest that you can go in the chemistry strand in TEA. Uh, but these students said, look, I'm really interested in this. I, I want to do more. So we pa partnered with Howard Payne University and they're able to take chemistry at Howard Payne and we're able to give them credit there for a, an advanced science. So we're happy about that. Uh, TSTC is a great partner. We use them a lot. Uh, Brownwood is very fortunate uh, for a city this size to have a technical college, a junior college presence, a uh, four-year university presence, and then uh, a great school system. So we're happy about all that. Well, we're here today, obviously, with the chamber, and we've got a lot of employers that are out there. So let's talk just a little bit about workforce training. Uh, number one, if, if a student is not going to go uh, to college, not going to that secondary education, or when we graduate from high school, are we ready to enter the workforce? It's question number one, and I'll go ahead and give you part two. What additional areas of workforce training do we need to be implementing and working on that we, we think we can improve on? Well, I'd just like to open this with one little um, kind of digress to what we were talking about earlier with our students who are taking the on-ramps courses. Just this week, we received an email that came to the district uh, from one of our students who's, in, who's at Tarleton now who took uh, on-ramps, I think it was pre-cal, uh, is that right? Yeah. And she took pre-cal last year on ramps from the University of Texas, and she emailed the district just this week thanking us for that, telling us how important that was for her to be able to have that introduction from uh, a, a four-year university such as UT uh, and uh, how it's benefiting her at Tarleton now. So, so I think what we're doing uh, post-secondary is working well. I think we're moving towards more partnerships and more things with regards to career and technology 
Uh, I think Dr. Young can elaborate that a little bit more. I would like to say that it's evident to me when I see some of the past graduates who are getting out that didn't go to college, they're working now. Uh, a lot of my uh, friends' uh, children are working uh, for some of these pipeline companies. Some are doing wind management type things. And so it's evident you can find it. It's pretty easy to see that these kids are ready to go to work or college. Joe, what do you think? Are we ready to get into the workforce? Uh, we are. I think future ready is the, the term that we like to use, whether that be college, whether it be workforce, or the military, or whatever their endeavor, we want to be sure they're ready. Uh, we started a new deal this year at the high school called the Business Industry Trade Showcase. Uh, the students in those career and technology courses invited local businesses that may be impacted by what they're doing. For example, we have an automotive technology certification where those students get ASC certification. And so we invited all the local dealerships to come to see what we offer there. Uh, we have a health science program that we offer pharmacy tech, uh, and we have great relationships with uh, the pharmacies around town, Jacobs Pharmacy, uh, Walgreens, CVS, those. And uh, we just recently got back into Brownwood Regional Medical Center, so we appreciate their partnership as well. Uh, we have, uh, this year we started welding, uh, listening to the community, uh, what, what kind of industry is coming and what, kind of, what are their needs. Uh, two years ago at the middle school, actually three years ago at the middle school, we had a great welding program. Uh, we got a lot of kids excited about welding, uh, but then when they moved up to high school, welding was not a separate course. It was kind of combined with our construction science. And so some of those students got a little disinterested and, and moved to other things. So what we did was we started a straight welding program where they can be certified at the high school. Uh, like I said, last year we had zero students in that program, and this year we have 71. Uh, enrolled in one year and so that's a lot of students that are interested in that so we're excited we in, we have a new uh, like I said new health science teacher for those trades there uh, we have computer science which we added this year we have uh, audio visual audio video production uh, that we added this year uh, and all those things are in uh, direct uh, answer to what we're hearing from the community uh, we also hear that uh, students need a lot of soft skills we hear that constantly be on time be responsible uh, be dedicated, those type of things. And I think my best answer to that is uh, those are the kind of things that we're very, very proud that we have over 75% of our students involved in extracurricular activities. Uh, because if you want to see dedication, if you want to see perseverance, if you want to see somebody who has to take responsibility, then last week at the youth fair you saw it. Uh, those students taking care of those animals, doing those projects year-round for that show, those are the soft skills that you continue to ask for. And so through extracurricular, we try, try to get those things as well. well. Let's talk budget just a second. So I know you guys struggle with some of the same things that we do at the city. Uh, for example, approximately 50% of our budget is payroll. So let's say I'm going to give, you know, raises every couple of years. There's, there's a lot of discussion in the news right now about, about raising our teachers' salaries. So let's talk just a bit about funding. I mean, tell us the challenges. Is there a simple solution to school finance uh, reform? And uh, and, and how is that impacting us on the local level? That's a heavy question. <laughs> you got two minutes. To school finance it needs to be revamped. Everybody knows that. Um, I think uh, we struggle locally with we're not we're not a Robin Hood district, nor do we receive anything. So we get what we get from the state, and we get what we get from ad valorem taxes. I think we've been pretty good stewards of the, of the money for, of, of, from our uh, citizens of this town. Uh, we lowered taxes uh, last year, actually, and that was due to some debt service issues and so forth. And so I think we're doing the best that we can with what we have. Uh, I, I, I don't think we're struggling at all, but I do think it would be nice to give teachers raises. We This year, we were able to give them an incentive uh, uh, payment, if you will, and that was fantastic for them. The teachers really appreciated it. I think it boosted their morale, and it felt good for us to do that. Uh, as I told some of the teachers, I would love to raise everybody's salary by X, Y, Z amount. If we were to do that locally, the only way we could do it was to raise your taxes. I don't think, I'm a citizen too, I don't want that either. So it's going to have to come from the state, and where that, where they're debating that now, there's been a bill introduced, and Dr. Young may know a little bit more about that. Uh, as you mentioned, over 75% of our budget is uh, personnel. Uh, the majority of the money goes back to the classroom teachers. Uh, and what we see is over the past three years, we've been able to give a 2.5% uh, midpoint raise to our employees each year. Uh, that ends up costing the district each year about $660,000 just to give that raise of 2.5%. And so when you look at uh, a budget that goes up by seven hundred dollars to $800,000 a year, 
uh, and 660000 of that is directly back to your teachers. That doesn't leave very much money to pay for the increased price of buses or the increased price of gas or the increased price of pencils. And, you know, as you mentioned earlier in the other presentation, the cost of living goes up. Uh, and so it doesn't leave a lot of money there. And so I'm very proud of our school board and the stewardship that they do. Uh, we were able to, when we do the budget, we have three priorities. Number one priority is our people. Uh, we set that priority before we even know what the taxes are going to be or what the budget's going to be. We do that before we get out of school, and we tell our employees, if you come back to work for BISD, here's what you're going to get, and here's what we're able to do. We were able to, to match the health care raise uh, that the state of Texas imposed on us. We were able to match that for our employees as well. Uh, and then we build the budget around that, because without great teachers, without great uh, people driving buses and serving food, we're not going to have a good school. Uh, and so we have to do that. The second thing is goes into our classrooms. Do we have computers? Do we have equipment? Do we have supplies like that? Uh, and then the last thing is the other stuff. Do we build awnings? Do we pave parking lots? Do we buy some extra school buses? Those are things that you see happen during the summer, and that's not by chance. That's because that's money that we were able to save for those. But if we had had a need for classroom supplies, if all the computers got rained on or we had a need for new computer equipment, then that money would have been sitting there to take care of our kids. So I'm uh, very proud of the way that we do our budget. Yeah, give you guys an idea of how difficult it is. So we've been averaging the city roughly 2% pay raises, you know, over the last several years. We don't do it every year, but we've done it every other year, and, it, and so it's averaging out somewhere between 1.5% and 2% on our pay raises. Well, a lot of times our dependent health care coverage, if an employee chooses to elect that, is gone up by 10, 12, 15, 20%. So there are actually times when, when our employees are actually getting a reduction in pay. Uh, because of the dependent health care coverage. So one last softball question uh, for you guys. Just, you know, tell us how this community supports uh, our schools, and, and then the flip side of that, uh, what, what can we do better? What can the community do to, to, to help improve our school system? Wow, it's, it, it, the, the, that's one thing, that, and I've been in Brown with 20 years, and, and so, uh, you, know, you know, what's the old adage? I wasn't born here, but I got here as quick as I could. Uh, Brownwood is the most supportive community that I've ever been a part of. Uh, with regards to their support of Brownwood ISD. It's evident in some building structures that, from the past and so forth. Uh, it's evident with, uh, with uh, support from some of the local industries such as 3M supporting us with some uh, programs and such. And so uh, how could the, I think the community of Brownwood supports Brownwood ISD so well, it's hard for me to say, how could you support us more? Uh, 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 I think it's a great partnership. Uh, as Joe ind indicated earlier, with the local uh, institutes of higher learning, as well as our industry, business, and, and the city. Joe, last yeah, word. It's great. Uh, I've been here three years now, and uh, it's the most supportive community I've been around. One thing that impresses me more about Brownwood than any place I've ever been, though, is, you know, support is not always, you know, rainbows and puppies. You know, the school business is hard. We've got a lot of kids that need us, uh, and it's a hard business. And so I appreciate the expectations of the community. I appreciate the expectations to continually get better. Uh, and then the people in the community are always there, whether it be through the Education Foundation, whether it be like uh, through the uh, corporations, as Mr. Cloy mentioned, to support you. Uh, and they say, we need, uh, I'll give you a very quick example. Kohler came to us a few years ago and said, we need students coming out that can work for us that are drug free on their tests. That's what we need. Uh, and when they did that, they didn't just say do it. They said, here is money. Here is a plan. Here are some ways that we've seen this be productive. And so we partnered with them, and we were able to implement those things in our community. So I appreciate the uh, support, but also the expectations uh, that Brownwood's students uh, and their kids are the future, and they expect us to uh, treat them right. And so I appreciate that Thank accountability. We, we want you guys to know how hard uh, the city staff and, and uh, the, uh, the chamber works towards making Brownwood a better place. So we have a little video here that we use uh, to help promote Brownwood, and we hope you'll enjoy the video. As it plays, help me in uh, thanking these guys for their service this morning. <laughs> Brownwood, Texas feels like home. Step back from daily distractions because it's usually the simple things that keep us the happiest.
celebrations big and small, and adventures for every age. In Brownwood, Texas, time slows down. Make memories that last. Stay a night, stay a lifetime. Discovery starts here. back to your seat. We're going to introduce our next guest. Please help me in welcoming plant manager at 3M, Russell Bryan. Ross, welcome. Thank you. <coughs> so just tell us, uh, what, what can you share with us about 3M and the plant? What, what's going on well and what's happening? Ah, uh, boy. So I've been here 20 months, I think. Uh, I was looking back at that here recently. So I was reflecting back on what, what's gone well. So uh, yeah, I was brought here, I think, to change the culture of the plant a little bit. I think there's a lot of uh, positive things happening at the plant. I think if you talk to our employees, they're seeing some of the changes. Right. Um, we've had some significant investments. A uh, couple of large ones, uh, upwards of $30 million going into the plant. Um, did want to squash a rumor that I heard. We sure. had a leadership team meeting here last week, and uh, apparently out in the community, there's some rumor that 3M's closing. <laughs> so our sign out in front was kind of peeling off, so we took it down. There's a group that we have to go through in corporate and redo the sign according to their specifications, and so it's been a while. So they and should have known because there's no movers in the front of my house that that's not true because I would be run <laughs> out of town if. Uh, yeah, and then and then if you drive by 3M, there's a big hole in the wall and there's right. a bunch of construction equipment out there and that's the hole that we're taking all the equipment out of the plant. So, so apparently, let's, let's <laughs> but that's actually a new investment going in. So I wanted so, to get that clear for so, everybody. So let's, you and I have talked about this offline before, but you know, last year there was a bunch of hubbub about. Uh, it wasn't hubbub, it was great news that President uh, Trump had reformed our tax reform and, and freed up some, some tax relief to our corporations. So has that made a difference? Has it made a difference for Brownwood, Texas? Uh, sure. I think, you know, I look at my capital budget that I was given this year. It's actually, uh, historically, it's about $3 million more than what we've gotten. Uh, I think it's made it easier to repatriate money from outside the U.S. Okay. Uh, we pay less taxes on that, bringing it back into the uh, U.S. economy. So I think that uh, has been an investment that we wouldn't have seen. Otherwise, so that's been definitely a positive for us. So, and it may be proprietary. If so, you may not be able to tell us. But what, what's changing at the plant? What's being put in? What, what's the expansion that's going on? Uh, we've got a couple of uh, areas. One of our areas is a high growth area. That one I can't talk too much about. But uh, some of our we're going away from 70 year old technology to some very new technology, new to the world technology. Um, the other uh, investment is actually a solvent less adhesive coater. So. Uh, as a company, we're trying to, you know, we really, really want to be a good corporate citizen. We're trying to move away from those old solvent-based products to solventless technology. And so that's the very large investment that you see the activity on the outside of the plant. Great. Now, I know that you were here before, right? Sure. Yep. And, and then made your way back to Brownwood. So, so tell me, you know, in between the times you were there, number one, how long were you gone? And then kind of what, what did you see changes in our community from before versus this, this stint? Sure. Uh, so, yeah, I started my career in 95. I was here about 10 years. Uh, met a wonderful lady from the big city of Zephyr, Texas, if anybody knows where that is. Uh, but uh, we left, we went to China, and we were gone, uh, went there, Iowa, Arkansas, and we made our way back. We were gone about 13 years. Okay. So, uh, you know, had a, kind of got a gap, 13 years there. Um, I'd say what I see is uh, some more, definitely retail, uh, restaurants, you know, there's more opportunities to uh, go out and entertain yourself. Uh, so I, I definitely have seen that change in the last 13 years versus when we lived here before. So, so hopefully, I mean, you enjoy those things personally, but, but does that have an impact on our industry? When, when we have new restaurants, when we have new retail growth, th does that help 3M? Does it hurt 3M? Are you indifferent? No, I, it definitely helps. Uh, so, you know, we, we employ a lot of uh, technical folks. So, you know, people 
you know, they, they have uh, expendable income, they're looking to do things. Um, and, you know, being a young single engineer here in my career when I started, I left town a lot. So the more that we can keep that uh, group here and engage them in the community, uh, you know, a lot better for them, uh, just from a quality of life standpoint. I was just talking to Lauren, which is one of our new engineers the other day, and uh, she's gotten onto a, a softball team. So she's playing softball at the new fields. Great. Uh, so that's one way, you know, just a touch point for someone that's getting engaged and tied into the community. Great. So, so tell us when you're recruiting and you're, you're bringing people into the community, I mean, I'm sure it's all across the board, but what type of people are you recruiting and, and bringing to Durham? Uh, well, certainly we have, uh, you know, our hourly folks. Uh, we always need production folks. Uh, did want to touch on that. So, you know, I heard the Brownwood ISD, you know, Dr. Joe there talk about some of the uh, uh, things that 3M's done. We actually have a program. It's called MAP. Uh, it's started up in the uh, Midwest area. There were nine facilities up there or locations, communities where 3M bought um, some electromechanical equipment. And it's really to certify kids coming out of high school and get them ready and used to working around equipment. So we're seeing that change in the workforce where, you know, kids used to a lot of times grow up on a farm or a ranch. They were around equipment. They understood it. Uh, not so much today. You know, maybe they ran a fryer or a, a, cash, a cashier. So um, we're partnering with uh, TSDC and some of the school districts around here. 3M uh, Foundation just passed, uh, gave the green light. So we'll be the first investment outside the Midwest uh, here in Brown County. So we're, we're excited about that. Great. Well, what um, 3M has survived out there for over 50 years. I think we had the 50-year anniversary here two or three years ago, if I recall correctly. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so tell me, what, what's the secret to the success? It, it appears to be expanding, growing, thriving. What do you attribute the success to? Uh, first and foremost, the workforce. Great workforce here in the community. Um, you know, again, I'm a little biased. Start, started my career here, so uh, a sure. little biased, but great workforce. Uh, people really care. Uh, for the most part, uh, and, you know, along with that, we're a very large plant. So, uh, if you're in a smaller plant in 3M, you know, a little 2050 type plant, uh, your future isn't always guaranteed. Uh, with the base that we have here uh, established, you know, they're going to continue to invest in us. Uh, we just have to deliver on those. Great. Well, so my last question is just from the community, from the city standpoint, but not just the city. Whether it's the school district, whether it's the the county or just our community as a whole, our citizens, what, what can we do as a community to continue to make sure that 3M doesn't close and succeeds <laughs> for another 50 years? Um, you know, I, th I think the continual investment in the community and bolstering the community, making it a better place to live, you know, that certainly is going to make our technical folks want to come and stay. Um, along that line, we're actually growing quite a bit. So I was able to uh, sell this year. We're going to be bringing in 17 additional technical people, so quality engineers, process engineers, product engineers. Uh, so that was a big win for the plant. Great. And you know, all those folks are going to come into the community, and we want them to establish roots and, and stay here as much as possible. Well, I've told you this before offline, but, but publicly, let me just reiterate that you know, we love 3M. They're, they're a great employee in our community, uh, and we hope you're here uh, long after you and I are gone, and, and uh, we appreciate your employees and appreciate the contribution. One of the things I will notice uh, over the years and make an observation for you is that how involved the 3M employees are in our community. I mean, there are soccer coaches, there are baseball coaches, there are Sunday school teachers, uh, and, and we very much appreciate that. As we, uh, as we transition here, we, we sent uh, a couple of our employees out uh, to find out what they knew about city government, and particularly the city council, and here's their video. Y'all help me thank Russ uh, from coming up today. Thank you. Do you know who the mayor of the city of Brownwood is? Uh, yes, sir. Stephen Haynes. Stephen Haynes. Uh, Stephen Haynes. Do you happen to know how many people are on the city council? I do not know. Uh, I'm gonna say six. Eleven. Twelve. Two. Ten. Uh, we'll go with fifteen. Uh, Twelve. Seven. Five. Can you name anyone on the city council? Draco. Draco Miller. H.T. Jones, Draco Miller, uh, Ed McMillan. H.T. Uh, Jones. H.T. Jones. Draco Miller. That's probably it. Who is the head football coach for the Brownwood Lions? Sammy Burnett. Sammy Lions. Burnett. Yeah. I forgot his name, but I do know him. I forgot his name. Um, his last name's Burnett. Sammy Burnett. Do you know what day of the week Underwoods is closed? 
Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah. Wednesday. Can you name one thing that you love about the city of Brown? Yeah, the people of here are friendly here. Uh, I like the people. It's home. There's more Longhorns than Aggies in Brown. They're on the It's just friendly. I think there's a lot of potential here that's just kind of untapped. We got one final guest today. Y'all help me welcome up our fourth guest, the co-owner of Weekly Watson's Hardware, Weston Jacobs. All right, so Weston, so uh, since I forgot to have the other guest draw uh, door prizes, you get to be the hero and draw a bunch of them, it. okay? Good. So we're going to start out first. First thing table. you get to do is give away some money. So the, the first two we've got, we've got a $25 gift certificate to Home Depot provided by Redstone Park and a $25 gift certificate for Humphrey Pete. So first uh, for Home Depot. I hope I win this one. <laughs> Did you earmark yours? <laughs> yeah. Uh, 962, last three digits, 962. That's right. right, don't cheer. Just kidding, that's happy. Come get your card. How many more we need? One more? One more for now. We'll do two more minutes. All right. 963. I didn't do that on purpose. There 962 you go. and 963. All right, Weston. So, uh, you know, we invited you here today uh, primarily because you represent the small business sector. So, just tell us, you know, what are some of the challenges of running a small business as opposed to a, a 3M or a superior asset to the world? Uh, I guess being localized and, and, and trying to keep on top of the growing, uh, I guess, techno technological wave. You, we see a lot of that. You know, my, my biggest, uh, I guess, adaption I have to make for the future is what are we doing about on online retailing? You know, that's the biggest thing. Amazon, everybody in here has probably bought something from Amazon in the last week. I have. And so how do I, how do I respond to that? How do I make my store uh, capable of providing those same kind of services in a succinct manner that's that's uh, saving your money. Okay, so probably most of these guys out here have seen your videos, and obviously you've been very <laughs> innovative in, in using uh, uh, Facebook with <laughs> videos and different posts. So, so tell us, I mean, do you, you you think that's the wave of the future? Is that what businesses have to do now to to get uh, to get customers? I think to some extent, yes. It, it's what's important now. Uh, is it a fad in some ex in some form or fashion? Yes. It's it's something that's popular now. There will be something next. What is that? I don't know yet. But when it's there, I've got to be ready to adapt. And that's the same for. There's tons and tons of uh, of small business owners in this room right now. And that's that's what we have to do is find a way. I'm I've only been in business coming up on two years, and I'm already finding ways to dig my heels in and say, I don't want to change like that. But uh, that, that's kind of what we have to do. What, so, so, you know, obviously you came back, uh, you, you lived here, you moved back to Brownwood, you, you came back here, you brought some, some fresh ideas, some new ideas, the technology component particularly. You guys remodeled the store, mm -hmm. right? So tell us for these small business owners that are trying to improve their business, what, what's working for you? To what do you attribute the success? Service. Uh, I, th I think anybody can sell you something. It's, it's what they're going to do when things go wrong. It's what they're going to do. Uh, even when things go right, how am I going to be there? Am I going to meet you at the door? Am I going to know who you are? Am I going to value your time? Uh, you, you know, the biggest aspect about my business is I want, you know, I'm not trying to just promote Weekly Watson here, but your time's valuable. I want you to come in and be able to do what you need and go on your day. Um, and, and that's what all of us have to do is value other people's priorities. So in, in, in a way, do you think as a small business that you have an advantage there? I mean, you, are you able to provide a better service maybe than the corporate conglomerate? And if so, why? I have the opportunity to. Whether I seize that or not is, is definitely up to me, the individual. So, yes, I do think that I have a, a great opportunity there uh, to have employees that have literally worked in my store longer than I've been alive that can meet their meet somebody at the door and when you say, hey, I need that, it's a little curly, d d and they know exactly what you're talking about. And that, that's incredible. And that, that's where we have the leg up, I think. Great. Well, obviously, <laughs> one of the other reasons I wanted you to come on our, on our show and talk to the audience today is, uh, obviously, you, you did grow up here, you moved back here and chose to make that decision. So, you know, tell us, was that a hard decision? Was it an easy decision? What were the factors uh, that, that influenced the decision? 
it was a big decision. Whether to say it was hard or easy, I don't think that's a good way to answer that. Um, but the biggest thing was, you know, me and my wife are young, and we wanted to get out and see other parts of the world. And I think that's important. I think we do need to get a, a broader worldview. Uh, but we came back because of, we thought about our future. We, we were planning on kids, wondering what that was going to look like. And now we've got a beautiful baby girl that I manipulate and use her for my social media. It's all a marketing gimmick. We had that baby four weekly Watson, so. Uh, <laughs> now you're having another one. Your sales are going to double. Uh, y'all, y'all heard him say it. Everybody, yeah. shop twice. <laughs> yeah, you, you've seen how chunky my baby is. It's <laughs> somebody's feeding her. Wait till you uh, have four. <laughs> Uh, but that, that was it. We looked at, I mean, you watched that video with the kids from East. Uh, that's why we moved back to Brownwood. We were living in Dallas, running the rat race, doing that. And it, there's good things about that. There's a lot about living in the big city that, you know, in some form or fashion, you don't have it here. But I, I looked at what do I want for my, at the time I didn't know, but for my girls. What do I want for them? Um, and Brownwood supplied every one of those needs in, in some form or fashion and in a way that I, I agreed with. So... If we're out there marketing the city, the EDC, the chamber, the, these local businesses, if we're out there trying to sell our community to young families, how would you sell it? Probably the entrepreneurial spirit. You know, almost everyone in this town has something going on that they're doing, that everyone is about something. They've got a task. They've got a goal. They're driven. I, I've never lived in a community that is so... I guess in the day, you, you, a lot of the places I've been are kind of autopilot. They do the same thing every day. Uh, but what I love about Brownwood is it, it is a change every day in the fact that everybody has such a purpose. Um, and I think that was big. That's a lot of the reason we moved here is we could, I, I could have more focused interactions with who I'm with, with my family, with my customers, whatever it is. Uh, and, and you don't get that in other places. Even in other small communities don't all provide that. But Brownwood's done a good job of that for us. Yeah. So obviously, you know, we're not without our flaws either. We've, we've got room for improvement on various different things. So uh, you're in my shoes. What's the biggest problem facing Brownwood today, and, and, and how would you solve it? Biggest problem is another tough question. Thanks for giving me the easy ones today. <laughs> I saved it for the end just for you. Oh, wonderful. I'm not coming next year. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's our attitude above all else. Uh, you know, I have obviously use social media in a lot of ways to try to make it a positive experience uh, for people. But at that same token, you've all seen it, it can be a downfall of a community. It can rip people to shreds from somebody sitting behind a keyboard. Uh, and, and just understanding what's real life and what's on the computer screen is important. I think that we change our attitude, we change our mindset, we don't get so bogged down in ripping each other apart, uh, especially you know, when it comes time to, you know, who knows what I'm gonna say about you if you try to get elected again. <laughs> After but today, it may not be good. <laughs> it won't be as good, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, it's important to just to get your head out of the muck. Quit right. getting stuck in it. Remember, I mean, we're community members. We're all here for the same reason. And whether it's because you love Brownwood or you're just trying to do right for your family, that's why we're here. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Well, that's a great ending note. Let's, let's do two more, uh, two more gift prizes. So we got a $25 gift certificate down for Pete's. You're getting them all circled up there, good. Yeah, I'm no trying more, not no to draw. What, what did I yeah. draw? 963 last? I don't want to get 964 because you're going to think it's rigged. 952. That's a good all one. All right, right and there. this one, to, this next one is a $50 gift certificate to Underwoods. Hey, now. $50. 950. All right, got that one? All right, guys, we got some guys we got to thank right quick and then we'll be done. I do want you to give a great round of applause for Underwoods for providing our meal today. I do, uh, I do also want you to, uh, to thank all of our guests. Please thank one, one more time Weston and all of our guests that joined me today. Uh, in closing remarks, I just want to, to, to hope you appreciated what we did today. I know it was different. You may have thought it was humorous. You may have thought it was great. You may have thought it was irreverent. Uh, everybody has their own different perspective on it. Uh, but one of the things that, that you can't look past is that our city staff uh, our council, uh, but particularly Marshall McIntosh, uh, Emily Crawford, and Ray Tipton put a ton of time and effort in putting this presentation together. I'd like you to thank them. I want you to know you've got good people working for you. Uh, we, we've got the best employees in the world at the city of Brownwood, 
uh, and, and we're fortunate to live in the best community in the world. I go all over the state of Texas representing the city of Brownwood, hold my head high and tell them that I'm the luckiest guy in the world to get to represent the best people uh, in our nation. Uh, guys like, like Weston, and I'll tell you something else. When we have young men like Weston coming back and providing an entrepreneurial spirit uh, to running a small business the way that he does, uh, we're doing something right as a community when we make people like Weston want to come back. Thank you, guys. Y'all have a great day. Thank you.